Sleep all day, party all night. <laughs> never grow old, never die. It's fun to be a vampire. That is a great fountain of youth concept. People want to go out, they want adventure. And I think maybe it offered us some adventure. I think that that's what uh, Lost Boys really did is it put some, you know, charisma on it and made made the whole thing more appealing and more romantic to everybody. Um, the idea of, hey, you know, you're not just dead. You're dead with bonuses. Of course, your soul is damned, but we don't worry about that too much when we're young. It's hard to think of vampires today and not imagine a smoldering hunk of a man straight out of a GQ magazine. From the Lost Boys' David to Twilight's Edward Cullen to True Blood's Eric Northman, they're pretty much a modern movie archetype, built and charismatic for the most part, and above all else, dreamy enough to be on a teenager's bedroom poster. And hey, it's a demographic we owe a lot to for the popularity of the modern hot vampire. Without the young, sexy appeal Joel Schumacher brought his Lost Boys, a movie some believe to have created the teen vampire genre, we likely wouldn't have gotten the dream boats of Buffy or, you know, Twilight. And without the success of Twilight, we probably wouldn't have gotten to see Ian Somerhalder or Alexander Skarsgård playing blood-sucking studs on screen. The advent of the hot teen vampire proved to be an incredibly popular and influential one, though the success of the concept lies beyond its highly marketable, attractive leads. Painting the trope through an adolescent lens proved to work incredibly well, as it turned out these creatures had far more in common with the teenage experience than meets the eye. History has always seen the vampire as a stand-in for the fears and anxieties of current society. In 17th to 18th century Europe, they represented fear of plague and disease, used as a scapegoat for unexplainable occurrences. In Greece, as early as 40 to 120 AD, they symbolized fears of what society then deemed as sexual deviance. Future literature would soon incorporate much of this theme in their stories, such as with the homoerotic undertones of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the introduction of lesbian vampires through Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla. Yep, that Carmilla. A character that also represented the era's fears of female sexual desires. These so-called monsters symbolized cultural nonconformity and the rejection of religious codes. They also often represented antisocial behavior, such as through their connection to animals and animal-like behavior. Vampires have thus always been a picture of the other, or immorality, or threatening unconventional ideas. Themes that would eventually see themselves in the creature's introduction to the big screen. On top of 1931, first film adaptation of Dracula, 1922 had Nosferatu and its themes of xenophobia, there were the erotic vampire films of the 1970s, the body horror of Cronenberg's Rabid, the social commentary of Romero's Martin. All these dealt with the archetype's historical symbolism of alienation slash isolation, sexuality, and cultural otherness. So laying all that down, it's no surprise screenwriters eventually started using the vampire for stories based on adolescent life and experiences. Like vampires throughout media and literature, there are many teenagers that often struggle with where they belong. It's not uncommon at that age to struggle with loneliness, alienation, ostracization. Like vampires, many can also relate to feeling othered. It's also that period of your life where you come to grips with your sexuality and sexual identity and the experiences or experimentation that come with that. And at the same time, because we live in a society, you'll also likely face the pressures of purity culture or sexually acceptable norms. And speaking of norms, teenagers are also typically drawn to rebellion and unconventionality, which often make them the unfortunate subject of moral panics and anxieties. Again, not unlike the vampire. So like I said, this is why the trope is so successful in telling youth-centered stories, both in movies and in literature. The two groups unexpectedly have many parallels, which ultimately has led to the popularity of the teen vampire cliche in Hollywood media, though having boy band good looks do help, I'm not gonna deny that. And to explore the rise of this once prominent trend in modern cinema, I think it's worth looking at two movies that I argue use the concept and its underlying themes best. Joel Schumacher's 1987 classic, The Lost Boy, and Matthew Reeves' 2010 indie flick, Let Me In. The 80s. 
Before getting sucked dry by Hollywood corpos to sell nostalgia, it was a pop culture era best known for its groundbreaking blockbusters, the birth of MTV, and thanks to primarily the works of John Hughes, the widespread popularity of the teen film. Though while his works and that of most others were often grounded in reality, typically set in suburban towns, high schools, and college campuses, director Joel Schumacher took the genre's relatable themes of love, rebellion, and self-discovery and gave it a unique, if not appropriate, twist. Enter Teenage Vampires. Though previously portrayed in much of mainstream cinema as either your typical ghouls of folklore or as your snobbishly high-class aristocratic gentlemen, 1987's The Lost Boys was the first to take all the exciting, idealized aspects of teenhood and fuse them with the selectively cool, if not creepy, positives of being an immortal vampire. The film was such a hit that it managed to pave the way for and influenced the eventual popularity of romanticized teen vampires in Hollywood, showing us that the trope could be more than just creepy rich men or beastly monsters. This included the global hit series Buffy the Vampire Slayer by Joss Whedon, who admitted the show was heavily influenced by the movie, from the setting to his vampires' character design. Gone are the garish capes, the elitist Victorian vibes, and the grotesque, demonic looks common of that in vampires' past. Schumacher showed us that these creatures can also be seen as young, sexy, and fashionable. Distinctively portrayed as rebellious, countercultural teenagers with great hair and a wardrobe plucked straight out of a Rolling Stone cover, the Lost Boys were free, fun-loving youths who answered to no one. Instead of the typical macabre appearance of Nosferatu or Dracula, they instead looked like any other young, carefree biker gang hanging around the Santa Cruz boardwalk. And even the setting, a lively amusement park by an oceanfront walkway, gives off these entrancing vibes of a 24-hour party, a far cry from the typically dreary, creepy backdrops common of previous vampire films. And it doesn't hurt that the movie's soundtrack is filled with classic rock and radio hits of the era, and the fashion reflects that of an MTV music video. To top all this off, the Lost Boys saw no grief in their vampirism, no long lost loves or longing for their mortal selves. Here, being a vampire was cool, it was something you wanted to be. They were a new generation of vamps representing everything a stereotypical teenager loves, camaraderie, parties, stylish trends, and freedom. Even the poster's tagline at the time further captures this intention, sleep all day, party all night, never grow old, never die. It's fun to be a vampire. Not to mention the fact that their name was also taken from J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, which featured a group of characters called the Lost Boys who never grew old and stayed in a state of childlike wonder. And this newfound youthful appeal absolutely stuck the landing. As I mentioned, the movie went on to influence plenty more teen vampire stories, effectively making rock stars or models out of these monsters. It's also worth noting that though another teen vampire movie, Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark, came out in the same year, its depiction of vampires, while also retaining a human appearance, were nowhere near as alluring as Schumacher's vision. Instead of being fashionable MTV stars, Near Dark's vampires were depicted as bleak, unkempt, disheveled drifters, which was the point, but of course they came off more threatening than appealing. And while a solid movie of its own, it also, sadly, had less of a cultural impact with its failure at the box office, though remains a cult favorite to this day. So aside from granting these monsters a glamorous new coat of paint, the movie also perfectly use these creatures to represent common themes of youth and growing up. Traditionally, vampires were portrayed as isolated and lonely due to their threatening, violent nature, forced into the role of an alienated other, with some seeking refuge among their chosen family of other vamps. The Lost Boys' protagonist, Michael, initially deals with finding a place to belong as the new kid in town, eventually getting adopted by David and his gang of vampires. Though falling under the classic trope of having a chosen family, it's portrayed as an overall positive or even desirable concept. Once Michael falls in with them and eventually gets converted to half-vampire by drinking David's blood, he soon finds himself caught choosing between his biological family and his newfound chosen one among the Lost Boys. It's a darker, bloodier spin on how adolescent friendships typically feel like family bonds, and often bearing values that clash with those of your actual familial relationships. It's also worth noting that with its release in the Reagan era, the film attempted to challenge the prevailing notions of family at the time. 
time, a period that hailed the traditional nuclear family as the ideal. All lead characters in the movie are from quote-unquote atypical family structures, Michael and his brother Sam are from a one-parent household, and the Lost Boys virtually live under no parental supervision. Then there's also, of course, the themes of rebellion. It's no surprise that vampires are seen as a defiance of cultural norms, often the source of moral panics and societal anxieties, something that definitely hits home for a lot of teenagers. And with adolescent characters at the forefront, the movie does well to represent the fears surrounding teenagers at the time. Compared to his straight-edge biological family, Michael finds the Lost Boys and their unconventional lifestyle exciting. They have the freedom of doing whatever they want, whenever they please, often engaging in dangerous or thrill-seeking stunts. And despite being painted as the overall antagonists of the film, something that I will dig a little deeper into later on, the Lost Boys have an alluring countercultural charm, bearing the punk rock or heavy metal aesthetic of the 80s that, quite fittingly, was the source of the satanic panic of that era. Schumacher himself even said that, The Lost Boys is, in a way, about the fear we have of the other, those who live outside of the mainstream. His vampires shamelessly own this, wearing their otherness as a source of pride and relating to all other teenagers ostracized for being or looking different. And finally, we can't have vampires without at least touching on themes of sexuality and self-discovery. These creatures have long been symbols of such, symbolizing fears of supposed sexual deviancy, lust, and sexual behavior outside of the so-called norm. Though The Lost Boys, which was notably directed by an openly gay Schumacher, features a heterosexual romance at the forefront, it also offers undertones of queer romantic tension between its two main leads. Though Michael falls for leading woman star and her seductive charms, eventually sleeping with the one female vampire in David's all-male group, queer readings of the movie have also noted the sexual tension between Michael and David. Michael is undeniably drawn to David and his lifestyle, even drinking his blood, which triggered his vampire transformation, despite Star's objections. Others have also noted how the Lost Boys seem to live a life completely devoid of women, seemingly only using Star as bait to lure Michael. During a scene where David dares Michael to let go as they hang dangerously off the bottom of a bridge, David's actor Kiefer Sutherland even stated himself that the whole scene where I catch Michael in the fog coming off the bridge, I mean it's a very sensual moment. And then we have what some saw as a subtle reference to homophobia, in which Michael's brother, Sam, threatens to out him upon finding out he's a vampire. On top of all this, the movie also came out during the peak of the AIDS epidemic. As written by Brandon Tensley, though the movie doesn't explicitly contend with AIDS, it nonetheless dealt with blood intimately, and between two men no less, at a time when the substance was fraught with new, grim connotations. So The Lost Boys offers us teen vampires at their finest, no doubt about that. But on the whole other end of the coming-of-age spectrum, we have Matthew Reeves' 2010 indie gem, Let Me In, which on the flip side took the more tragic aspects of vampirism to highlight the angst and social struggles of those coming of age. It's less of a cultural icon than The Lost Boys, but it also painted a youthful and even innocent version of this classic monster, while using its lore to elevate its portrayal of teenage life. And while also not a box office success, sadly, the original Swedish film that it was based off of, Let the Right One In, was a film that went on to win multiple awards, as well as rank among plenty of critics' top films in the horror genre. Here, the more traditional, mournful aspects of the vampire are reflected in the film's more grounded, emotional themes of bullying and isolation, all depicted through the lens of two 12-year-old leads. Just as partying and adventure are common among those growing up, so too are these issues of alienation and belonging. We follow Owen, a 12-year-old dealing with the loneliness of having no friends, divorced parents, and violent bullies, along with a vampire named Abby who also deals with the loneliness rather than glamour of eternal youth, as well as having no family or friends. Both characters thus find connection and understanding through their similar circumstances, offering us a movie that's less interested in glamorizing adolescence, but rather highlighting the darker, shittier aspects of it. All the while still giving us a somewhat hopeful coming-of-age story. Abby, unlike the Lost Boys, is your typical tragic vampire, though like them, has an otherwise normal and even innocent human appearance. With the seemingly harmless, angelic looks of any other 12-year-old girl, it's easy to see why Owen would be drawn to her. However, she isn't wearing the latest fashion, running around and partying till sunrise. She's an incredibly lonely outcast, and so is Owen. If the Lost Boys gave us the cool, popular high school clique in the form of vampires, Let Me In gave us the quiet, sympathetic underdog. These themes are emphasized through the film's consistent melancholic tone, along with dark, washed-out visuals and an original simple score, there are no radio hits used this time, 
I'd say this allowed the film to dive deeper into the characters, their developing relationship, and the issues that they face. And in this way, its coming-of-age subject matters were arguably much stronger than in Schumacher's film, despite sadly having less of a pop culture impact on the teen vampire genre. Like his movie, themes of family are quite obvious in Let Me In. Our protagonist, Owen, struggles with having an absent father and a somewhat neglectful mother. Abby survives without a family at all, unless you count her familiar. Both characters are loners with no real friends, though eventually find their version of family through their companionship with one another. Abby encourages strength in Owen to retaliate against his bullies, something not even his own parents would do. And Owen helps her experience the activities and adventures of any human kid her age. Of course, there are also themes of being the other, though through a much more somber lens. Rather than empowering Abby for being different, her character is used to highlight the pains of being different, something she heavily relates to Owen with. As mentioned, both are loners and social outcasts. Abby deals with the alienation of looking but not being human, while Owen is literally called a freak by his bullies, amusingly enough by a fetus version of Dylan Minnette from 13 Reasons Why. Jessica's right. Hate is easy. It's a film that focuses more on the alienation rather than the devil may care rebellion of the Lost Boys, though still harkens to certain moral panics of the era, often making references to religion and the concepts that defy it. Abby, of course, is an obvious symbol of this, though the movie also mentions anxieties around the existence of satanic cults and activity. It's worth noting that while this movie was released in 2010, it was also set during the satanic panic of the 80s. Additionally, as the movie progresses, we see Owen rebelling against his mother's strict religious rules to spend more time with Abby. In one scene where he sneaks out of the house, we even get a lingering shot of his mother's TV displaying this. And finally, of course, the movie does also tread one's coming-of-age experiences with sexuality. It features younger kids on the cusp of teenhood, so it thankfully doesn't explore its characters' experiences with sex, but rather their curiosity and insecurities surrounding the concept. Owen, for one, is constantly drawn to staring at other teenagers kissing their partners, and is repeatedly seen peering in on his neighbor's most intimate moments. Like in The Lost Boys, the movie also deals with casual homophobia. Owen's bullies repeatedly call him a girl before attacking him. He doesn't want everyone to see what a little fucking girl he is. <laughs> As unlike the other boys, Owen is smaller and less athletic. Abby, on the other hand, is insecure about the fact that she's not fully a girl. Interestingly enough, the book version of her, originally named Eli, was actually depicted as a castrated androgynous boy. It's worth noting that in one scene, she confronts Owen with the question, Would you still like me? Even if I wasn't a girl? Would you still like me? To which Owen responds with, But no. I guess. In place of sexual experiences, the movie portrays its themes of sexuality through innocent curiosity and self-discovery. As Abby and Owen eventually form a connection, we see a puppy dog version of romance blossom between the two, as they navigate their feelings and the complications of Abby's vampirism. Once again, this concept of melding both adolescents and vampires wasn't so much a random, bizarre choice as it was fitting, and I'd argue inevitable. Both movies, though from different eras with vastly different stories, arcs did well to show us how unexpectedly appropriate the trope is to teenage life, as these creatures and what they stand for do reflect much of what we go through, idealize, and grapple with at that age, and were used effectively in these stories to elevate these portrayals of youth. And I'd argue this is why vampires are still very much the monster of choice when telling paranormal or gothic YA stories. That isn't to say, however, that these movies' depiction of such themes were perfect, and here's where I want to get into the perhaps unintentional negative negative implications of either film. While vampires were used in The Lost Boys in an attempt to subvert common, harmful notions of those who are different, they're still villainized by the ending. Sure, Michael found a group to belong to, but they ultimately end up betraying him. And the wholesome, rule-following hero, as played by his brother, still ends up defeating the cool rebels by the end of the day. Not to mention the fact that by the end of the film, Michael is successfully converted back to human, ending up with Star and creating problematic 
dramatic implications with the movie's allegories to homosexuality. Still, despite these flaws and eventually villainizing its vampires, The Lost Boys was just so good at making these creatures cool, empowering, and desirable that they will nevertheless be remembered for that and will continue to charm the proud, nonconformist rebel in all of us. Then there's Let Me In and its bittersweet ending. Unlike The Lost Boys, the film has Owen and Abby run away together by the movie's finale, ultimately doubling down on its uplifting message of belonging and unconventionality. And yet still, the implications are quite tragic. In earlier scenes of the film, we see an old man living with Abby, implied as her familiar, or vampire servant. Their relationship is strained, as Abby threatens and pushes him around to do her bidding. We then later find out that this man used to be in Owen's place, a close friend, and perhaps even a boyfriend, who eventually outgrew Abby in age, though stayed by her side. So even though Abby and Owen end up together, content in finally finding companionship, her history implies that this might not last. My first reaction was, oof, this kid is in for a rough time once he hits his late teens. Of course, this doesn't take away from how fantastic the movie is, as it's nevertheless a moving tale of young love and friendship with a paranormal twist. But if you are, however, craving a more optimistic, fairy tale like romance, look no further than the height of teen vampires in Hollywood. On the 2nd of June, 2003, then-aspiring author Stephanie Meyer had a dark and strangely vivid dream. Under the bright sun on a circular meadow, she dreamt of two young people having a conversation, the one being what she described as a beautiful, sparkly boy, and the other a normal human girl. The boy was a vampire, she shared in a CNN interview, and he was trying to explain to her how much he cared about her and yet, at the same time, how much he wanted to kill her. Well, I was taking the, I did the dream and then I wanted to see what would happen to them. It was just me spending time with this fantasy rope. And when it was finished, it was like, this is long enough to be a, a book, even. <laughs> As many avid fans already know, this one passing yet memorable dream would inspire one of the largest pop culture phenomenons of the millennial generation, a phenomenon that would put teen and sparkly, spooning romantic vampires on the map. Just as the vampires' tragic themes suitably applied to the angsty tales of youth, Hollywood would soon find that so too were they able to make for addictive romances targeted at young teens. Stephanie Meyer's Twilight novel series wasn't exactly a pioneer in the teen vampire romance genre. That title likely belongs to The Silver Kiss by Annette Curtis Klaus or even The Vampire Diaries by L.J. Smith. But its film adaptations from 2008 onwards skyrocketed teen vampires and their affairs with innocent adolescent girls to a never before seen level of pop culture fame. Robert Pattinson and Taylor Lautner, who played lead vampire Edward Cullen and lead werewolf hunk Jacob Black, were the Hollywood it guys for years on end, or the punching bags depending on your circle. Barnes and Noble had to set up a separate section for paranormal romance due to the books' popularity. Forks, Washington became a hot tourist spot just for being the story's main setting. And just last year, Stephanie Meyer released a retelling of the first book, this time from the vampire's perspective. You're just like an angel. Your skin makes me cry. So it's clear that Twilight and all its romantic vampirism was quite the pop culture icon, possibly even more so than The Lost Boys based on awareness alone. And it's easy to pinpoint why. Taking a page from the Schumacher hit, Meyer's books amplified the sexual appeal of the vampire, while their unconventional elements were further glorified rather than feared. The Cullens, aka the leading vampires of the series, are all portrayed as attractive, cool, and mysterious, and especially so with leading man himself, Edward Cullen. However, Meyer does make make a few key changes to make these creatures even more alluring and romantically ideal to young audiences. For one thing, they barely change appearance from their conventionally attractive human form, if at all, even at their most violent. Secondly, and probably the most notable change, they sparkle, rather than burn in the sun, giving our leading man Edward an almost angelic appearance. And of course, every single one of these vampires are pretty f***ing hot. So it's not hard to see why young viewers were drawn to Meyer's vampires, and subsequently, its love story between a vampire and an ordinary human. With its handsome leads and romantic themes, fans could project themselves in the shoes of lead girl Bella Swan, and it helps the story doubles down on how desirable, rather than terrifying, the vampire world is. In the fourth book, we even see Bella compare her human life as lesser to her potential one as a vampire. So similarly to The Lost Boys, Twilight 
might glamorize these creatures as different but beautiful, granting them the same level of appeal as Disney princes. To be honest, probably even greater. But that's not to say the series was completely devoid of the sad, tragic themes typical of vamp-centric tales. It's just in this case, they were spun into dramatic love stories that successfully captivated adolescent audiences. But how and why exactly? Admittedly, though I was able to watch the movies courtesy of some friends, I wasn't really part of the Twilight fanfare back in the day. Luckily, I know someone who was, so I'm gonna let Steph from the amazing quality culture fill you guys in. So Twilight is far from from the first property to capitalize off the idea of sexy, mysterious teenage vampires. And it definitely wouldn't be the last. But there was a lot about this series in particular that, despite it being a beacon for widespread mockery, made it a huge phenomenon which launched an explosion of vampire-related media. Whether or not you detest Twilight, you can't deny its cultural impact. Even in the last year or two, it's made a resurgence online. Though this time around, people enjoy it mostly ironically. Nevertheless, I'm going to try to explore why Twilight became so popular in the sphere of teen vampire romances. I first read the book by Meyer in 2006, a couple of years before the movie adaptation. And I won't lie, eighth grade me was all in for this melodramatic love affair. I mean, I wasn't a merch buying, midnight premiere kind of fan, but I did own the books in hardcover. Though by the time the franchise reached its peak, sometime after the first film, I was already on my way out of the fandom. Mostly because I tried rereading it and it occurred to me just how poorly written the novels are, but that's beside the point. The 2008 film starring Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson, who have since miraculously and deservingly revived their careers, gave pretty faces to the angsty characters we'd grown to care for. Taylor Lautner also later added to the frenzy of picking a side in the triangle. Are you Team Jacob or Team Edward? Anyway, like Anna said, Bella's feelings of inadequacy gave her reason to contemplate her status as a meek human. And if you notice that Bella has almost no personality aside from mild intelligence, this essentially led to readers having an easier time of making her a placeholder for themselves, a self-insert type of character for their own romantic fantasy. Bella's pretty average in every sense of the word. She's not hot or a badass like Buffy, nor is she particularly interesting or talented. She even points out her overwhelming ordinariness to Edward on many occasions, very clearly indicating her abysmal self-esteem which almost crossed the bounds into self-loathing. In the first book, it seemed as though when she wasn't busy making gratuitous declarations of love, she was putting herself down. Yet she has all the boys in this small town fawning over her. And more importantly, Edward thinks she's exceptional. To him, she's not like the rest. He tried to stay away, but he just couldn't bear not being with her. All these other teen girls have vapid interests about prom and shopping and sex. The horror. Meanwhile, Bella listens to classical music. She's a good student. She doesn't wear makeup. She's mature for her age. She's not interested in shopping for clothes. She'd rather go to a bookstore. You're not really into this, are you? I actually really just want to go to this bookstore. Did I forget to mention she's lovably clumsy? And she's the only person whose mind Edward can't read because her brain is just that special and unique. I think it's understated just how much the I'm not like other girls craze in the 2000s contributed to Twilight's success. Again, preteen and teen girls reading Bella's first person story often saw themselves in her in some respect including this subtle superiority complex. And yet, there's this paradox where Bella's simultaneously better than all the other girls, but still feels too worthless to be good enough for Edward. Since lack of self-esteem also parallels the adolescent experience, Twilight's romance hit home with plenty of teenage fans. To feel utterly unremarkable and still be loved unconditionally, especially by a being as powerful and otherworldly as Edward, well, that's the pinnacle of young romantic escapism. Meanwhile, Edward's physical masculinity, his strength, speed, and general dominance provided by his status as a vampire, combined with his emotionally sensitive demeanor, makes him a rather compelling potential partner. He can protect Bella against those who would do her harm, but typically doesn't display any overt machismo to accompany this power. Plus, it doesn't hurt that immortality is a possibility. Eternity with the one you love does seem like a desirable outcome on the face of it. Most significantly, Edward's a vampire who rebukes his monstrosity and chooses a vegetarian lifestyle, preying on animals instead of humans. 
existence. He hates the nature of his existence and considers it an immense burden, an affliction. I haven't read Midnight Sun, the Twilight book from Edward's point of view, so feel free to weigh in if you have, but repression appears to be a pretty glaring theme when it comes to Edward's plight. And this suppression of his instincts, including sexual ones, also plays a major role in the series' popularity. The big draw to most intense romance stories is the pure, unadulterated pining. In this case, it's driven by the idea of forbidden fruit, a biblical symbol taken from the story of Adam and Eve and acknowledged on Twilight's cover. Meyer even quoted the book of Genesis in the dedications page. She says that aside from this, she didn't intentionally include religious concepts from her Mormon background, but you know, people's personal experiences tend to seep into their work anyhow. Stuff like Bella being absolutely appalled at the idea of people having casual sex, or making a big deal out of using cold medicine to sleep, saying she normally wouldn't condone that type of behavior, or Edward repeatedly talking about his soul being damned to hell for all eternity. You know little things. Regardless, religious themes and undertones are essentially a staple of vampire stories at this point, so it's not much of a departure from standard practice. Though among these themes, repression plays a pretty key role in Twilight's romance. Edward's old-fashioned, chaste principles and insistence on marriage before sex gave it a captivating slow burn, but it also notably provided a sheltered avenue for young girls to navigate and explore those hormonal changes they'd talked about in gym class lectures. Like Anna mentioned, vampire stories let teens explore their curiosity about sexuality, and Meyer wrote about it in a distinctly innocent way. Stephen King explained it pretty well. In the case of Stephanie Meyer, it's very clear that she's writing to a whole generation of girls and opening up a safe kind of joining of love and sex in these books. It's exciting and it's thrilling, and it's not particularly threatening because they're not overtly sexual. A lot of the physical side of it is conveyed in things like the vampire will touch her forearm or run a hand over her skin, and she just flushes all hot and cold. And for girls, that's a shorthand for all the feelings they're not ready to deal with yet. And King's not exaggerating. Bella's overwhelmed reaction to Edward's mere touch is a feature of so many pages that it actually gets pretty tedious. So Edward presented as safe, but still mysterious and broadly desirable, a character to latch those new, vulnerable feelings onto. He's the self-proclaimed bad boy without actually being that bad or dangerous, as he thirsts for Bella's blood but doesn't give in to temptation, choosing the moral high ground instead. Of of course, by this point we understand he sucks in a totally unintentional way, no pun intended, as the negative interpretations of his character became more or less culturally accepted after years of critical analysis. Edward's far from wholesome in the end. He's bad not because he's a vampire, but because of the possessive, controlling, stalkery behavior we somehow accepted as expressions of love at the time. He may not have drunk Bella's blood or slept with her, but he still fully took advantage of their uneven power dynamic, so he's a predator for a whole different reason. And at times the descriptions of blatant codependency on both Edward and Bella's part feel outright disturbing. This is supposed to be a romance story, but very little actual love is depicted between the two. There are plenty of obsessive declarations of how much they need each other and how no one else matters as much, including their nice families. And this starts like a month into the relationship, might I add. But ultimately it's all passion, no friendship. Drama is generally more interesting to read about in fiction, but it's a tricky balance to tread when your core audience audience is made up of impressionable young people who put Bella and Edward's love story on a pedestal. As adults, we obviously know that obsession, blind devotion, and needless self-sacrifice doesn't make a relationship. And romantic love shouldn't be the only valuable component of your life. But it's harder to grasp all that when you're a young teen who's probably never been in a relationship before, let alone a healthy one. So they tend to latch on to the ideas of love they see around them. We latched onto Twilight and Bella and Edward's passionate, shitty love story, hoping we were also special enough for a powerful but virtuous vampire to care about us that much. I was always Team Jacob though, until you know, the whole falling in love with a baby thing. And with that, I'll let Anna take it from here. As Steph mentioned, Twilight was far from pioneering the teen vamp romance genre, nor was it the last to have one. Before it, audiences were already swooning over the will-they-won't-they they romances of Buffy and Spike and Buffy and Angel from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, say that ten times fast. The popularity of Twilight's love triangle was soon followed by that of the Vampire Diaries on the CW. And like it, its vampires were hot, mysterious, and oozing with angst, begging to be saved by the love and affection of our female lead. And sure, 
sure the series did build itself a dedicated fan base of its own and was successful enough to cough up a reboot no one really likes to talk about, but when it comes to reshaping teen vampires for the new generation, flawed as it is, that title goes to Twilight. And no movie or series starring adolescent vamps has ever really been able to replicate its success since. That isn't to say we didn't get any that tried. 2014 saw the film adaptation of Vampire Academy based on Rochelle Mead's novels of the same name to embarrassing commercial and critical reception. I'm gonna try and hold myself back from absolutely trashing this film because whew, you can barely call it one, but after regrettably seeing it for myself, I am not surprised. It's a shame too, since based on what I've read about the novels, Mead had some pretty unique ideas that could have very well steered teen vampires, at least on film, in a new creative direction. Sure, there's an overarching romantic plotline, as is typical of the vampire trope, but rather than having this as the central story arc, this time we get to have a female friendship at the forefront. Our lead also isn't some spellbound human entranced by the vampire world, world, but a half-vampire herself, and definitely isn't some damsel in distress. Rather than set in some dreary suburban town, Mead's stories are set on the campus of St. Vladimir's Academy, which I can only describe as like a vampire Hogwarts. It seems that her books could have brought a fresh, fun twist on the teen vampire movie trend, drawing more on high school experiences and young female friendships, as well as classic themes of social class and discrimination. But Prager Entertainment kind of f***ed that up. Speaking of female leads in relationships, 2020 saw another attempt at breaking the teen vampire mold with Brad Michael Elmore's indie film, Bit, starring a coven of all-female vamps that roam the streets of Los Angeles. Dressed up in the glitz and glamour of LA's nightlife with hip, fashionable leads, the movie, at first glance, felt like a gender-swapped Lost Boys, yet another film adding youthful charisma and an underground charm to the trope. And much like the Lost Boys and its homoerotic undertones, Bit deals with themes of sexuality and sexual identity, albeit much more openly. Most, if not all, of the movie's leads are queer. Our protagonist, in particular, is a trans woman dealing with her identity post-transition, finding a sense of belonging through the Coven's sisterhood. I thought the story had potential and would have been a compelling exploration of these coming-of-age themes. Despite being coded using the vampire, the movie, unlike The Lost Boys, doesn't unintentionally turn in its own queer symbolism by making total monsters of their leads by the film's end, at least not without reason. Sadly, the movie suffers from an honestly mediocre script and flat acting in parts and never really hones in on the issues it harkens to. At the end of it all, what could have been meaningful themes just ended up feeling decorative and tacked on, and the movie sadly was overall forgettable in my opinion. But I do want to note a little indie gem in 2016 that had everything going for it as far as teen coming-of-age vampire movies go, and could have very well breathed new life into the genre. And that is Michael O'Shea's directorial debut, The Transfiguration. Sadly, no one watched it. And honestly, I wouldn't have even known about this movie if it weren't for a helpful follower on Instagram. Released at the Cannes Film Festival, The Transfiguration follows the life of a troubled 14-year-old boy or vampire named Milo. A huge fan of popular vampire lore himself, which includes much of the movies I've mentioned in this video, we see him deal with the complications of his supposed transfiguration, along with a ton of emotional baggage from a rather tragic family incident. This film was excellent, striking an elegant balance between its coming of age Age and vampiric themes of survival, alienation, and grief, while adding a unique layer of meta to the story. Like I said, it was interesting seeing a lead discuss his thorough knowledge of vampires and their many portrayals in pop culture, while attempting to live as one himself in the modern quote-unquote real world. Without accidentally spoiling anything, the movie manages to subvert the trope in a strange yet engaging way, creating a memorable yet depressingly realistic vampire tale in the age of adolescence. Though while reception to this movie was generally positive, it's one that's barely been talked about beyond film communities, and given how it was ballsy enough to do something different with the genre and to great effect at that, it's a shame. So it's pretty safe to say that teen vampires found their peak in the late 2000s, and as interesting as the concept was, and still is I would say, they've yet to reignite, much less surpass, the fame of Twilight or even The Lost Boys. The popularity of YA romances have also shown how profitable these kind of teen vampire stories are. And not to say that escapist fantasies are bad at all, nothing wrong with wanting to enjoy your vampire love stories, but it'd be interesting to see more of these films focus on the relatable complexities of growing 
growing up and finding yourself, or dealing with newfound adulthood. Given what the trope stood for throughout time, it's incredibly effective at that. Still, I haven't given up on this incredibly niche genre. Through its versatility and social significance, vampires will continue prevailing as a staple of modern media and literature. They're the granddaddy of all movie monsters, as this editorial puts it, with its sheer ability to embody the fears and desires of each generation. And of course, their sex appeal lends to their everlasting popularity. Zombies, popular as they are in their own right, are, you know, gross. Fairies and elves are a little too good and pure, and werewolves, with the exception of Taylor Lautner and the guys from Teen Wolf, I guess, are often too animalistic. Not to mention the fact that they're also mortal, which is boring. So as it stands, vampires make the most marketable romantic leads, at least as far as monsters go. And coming-of-age movies aren't gonna go away anytime soon. If anything, we're getting better at telling genuine stories from varying backgrounds and perspectives. So it's really only a matter of time before two of my favorite genres find themselves another hit. And hey, as long as it doesn't glorify stalking and weird possessive relationships, I'll be there for it. Though honestly guys, please check out The Transfiguration, it's the best thing we've got for now. So that about wraps up this essay. Of course, if you know of any other quality teen vampire movies that I might have missed, do let me know, I am open to new recommendations. Thank you to those on Instagram who helped me out in my research for this video by recommending awesome vampire movies to check out. And a huge thank you to the lovely Steph from Quality Culture for helping out with this video. It was awesome awesome working with her, and if you've yet to check out their channel, I can't recommend it enough. Been a long time fan of these guys, and they do amazing video essays on a whole bunch of pop culture subjects. If you're up for another creature feature analysis, I highly recommend checking out Steph's essay on The Shape of Water, which is probably one of my favorite movies to have come out in 2017. Plus, I also made a guest appearance in one of her latest videos about falling for AI, so go check that out. And were you ever part of the peak vampire craze of Hollywood back in the day? Not just Twilight, but you know, Vampire Diaries, True Blood, or other hits that come to mind. If you could have more monsters represent teenage experiences, what would they be? As always, of course, drop a like if you enjoyed this video, and feel free to subscribe for more pop culture commentary slash video essays. Maybe even hit that notification bell to keep up to date on my latest uploads and all that fun stuff, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.